Welcome. In this course, we're going to take a look at virtual networks in Windows Azure. I'm, my name is Corey Hines. I'm going to be your instructor. Um, what we're going to be looking at in this module uh, in terms of networking is a couple of things. We're going to begin by looking at some of the considerations for planning virtual networks. We're then going to move into some of the common management tasks, so things like how do we create virtual networks, how do we assign IP addresses, move into a section on IP addressing, and then begin to talk about some of the network services that are available, like, for example, DNS load balancing. And then finally, how do I connect Azure networks to each other, to the internet, and then also to my on-premise network in my own data center? So that's our plan for the course. We're going to go ahead and get started with our first module. The first module is planning virtual networks. Now to begin planning virtual networks, you want to begin with an understanding of all the components that make up Azure virtual networking. We we'll begin with VNets. VNets or virtual networks are the basic building block. A VNet is a container for all other networking objects, including things like IP addresses, which can be private or public, and subnets, which are used to group addresses into different logical subnets. They work just like physical subnets. We also have network interfaces. Network interfaces are the method you use to configure IP addresses on virtual machines. You don't go into the VM and set the IP, you create a network interface that contains an IP and attach it to a virtual machine. We have DNS. This is exactly your traditional domain name services, but Azure has its own version of DNS that you can use. You have load balancers, you have application gateway and traffic manager, all of which service to distribute load across multiple instances of an application in Azure. We have network security groups, which allow us to provide rules that govern what types of traffic, you know, your typical port and protocol, can, that can move between different endpoints within VNets. We have, our, we have custom routing, we have tunneling, and we also have the notion of connecting multiple sites or multiple networks together through either VPN technologies, regional VNets, or something called Express Route. The, the most common question that's often asked when we begin to discuss Azure networking is, is that's great, but how do I connect to it? Well, if you have an on-premise data center and you have resources that you have deployed in Azure, how, what are the options available to you? Well, you have five options. You have, sorry, well, excuse me, you have four options. You have a site-to-site -site VPN. A site-to-site -site VPN allows you to connect your on-premise network to an Azure network by installing a gateway component on both ends. They'll create you know, a traditional VPN tunnel across the public internet, and you'll be able to move data back and forth encrypted on the public internet. You have point-to-site VPN which is a single PC or a single user connecting to an Azure endpoint over a VPN. If you have two different VNets in Azure, and they're in different, say, geographic locations, you can connect those VNets together using a gateway in either one, and we'll be showing you how to do this. And then finally, if you're going to be moving a lot of data, you don't want to go over the internet, the public internet, you can use something called Express Route. Express Route directly connects you to an Azure instance without needing to go across the public internet or VPN. One of the things you're going to have to think about as you design networking is your IP address space and subnet allocation. Some considerations for this or things you want to think about. You want both private and public non-overlapping address spaces. When you're designing your subnets, understand the first three IP addresses and the last three are not available for use. The first address that's allocated is the fourth address within a subnet. And the smallest subnets you can use are 29-bit subnets. It's also worth noting within Azure, subnets use what are known as CIDR notation, or C-I-D-R. For example, if you're on a PC, you might see a subnet as 255.255.0.0. Well, in Azure notation, that will be a slash 16 subnet. CIDR stands for Common Internet Domain Routing. This is actually the way that IP addresses have been described before the, the traditional 255 model. So when you see a subnet in Azure, you describe it with a slash number of bits. 255, 255 is slash 16, 255 is slash 8, 
and a, a class C subnet will be a slash 24. It is highly recommended that you keep dynamic addresses and statically assigned IPs on separate subnets to make the management easier because you don't have as much control over which addresses go where. And then finally, if you have two subnets in the same VNet, the routing's automatic. You don't need to worry about configuring routers or default gateways. That happens 100% automatically. So you can create two subnets, attach two VMs, they'll be able to ping each other. Azure takes care of the underlying routing and the underlying gateways. Now along with IP addressing comes name resolution. There are a number of options for name resolution within Azure. So let's look at some of these different scenarios and some of the options. Azure provides, and I guess the, the first thing to understand is that Azure provides automatic name resolution for virtual machines that are deployed within a VNet. So if I have, within the classic portal, um, two virtual machines that are on the same cloud service, they'll have automatic name resolution. If I have two VMs on the same VNet, I have automatic name resolution, or I can install my own DNS server. You always have the option to add your own DNS server. If I have two separate role instances, I can use my own DNS implementation, or I can use Azure for the first 100 cloud services. If I have two different VMs that are on different VNets in different, you know, maybe in different subscriptions or in the same subscription on different virtual networks, then I have to use my own DNS implementation. Azure's automatic DNS implementation doesn't route between two VNets. Between on-premise and external endpoints, so for example, something in my, in my Azure VNet and something on the public internet, I've got to use normal external DNS, and between my own infrastructure in my data center in Azure, I've got to provide DNS. So if you want a kind of a simple way of thinking about this, if you have a small implementation, you know, a single VNet and everything is self-contained, Azure DNS takes care of just about everything. If you want custom control, you can install your own DNS server on either a Windows box or, as you'll see later in this course, you can actually install Azure's DNS service in your subscription and, and create records that way. This module will take a look at some of the ways that we manage virtual networks within Azure. The first way is, what if I'm using the classic portal? Well, in the classic portal, we create something called a virtual network. So under new, I go to network services and I identify virtu a virtual network. From there, I can configure the virtual network's address space, the overarching address space of the virtual network, and then add individual subnets. I need, to create a virtual network, I need at least one address space, and then within that address space, I need at least one subnet. Once that's created, I can begin attaching resources to it. If I want to do this programmatically, it's done via a configuration file. So you would use a get Azure VNet config, it would download the network configuration as an XML file. You could then modify it for example, to add additional subnet nodes, and then upload it with set Azure VNet config. So if you want to automate it in the old portal, this is the method that you would use, the Azure um, Service Manager model uh, for, the, for the old portal. In the newer portal, you're going to use the Resource Manager model, and again, the process of creating a VNet, which is the equivalent of a virtual network, is again, very similar. Go to, the, go to the, uh, the marketplace, you're going to search for a virtual network in the marketplace, and then simply follow the wizard to fill out the assorted properties in the blade. One of the things that you will establish is your first subnet as part of creating the VNet. You can then add additional subnets to it later. Doing it via script, again, fairly straightforward. There's a set of PowerShell commandlets, new Azure resource group, create a virtual network, create a subnet config, and then add the configuration to the network. So very straightforward to do with PowerShell, certainly a lot simpler than using the configuration file method that was done with the classic portal. So now let's go ahead and create some networks in the Azure portal. Okay, here we are in the Azure 
portal, we're going to go ahead and create some new VNets or virtual networks. So in a resource group, uh, nice and empty, just so we can see everything nice and clear. I'm going to click add and type virtual network. Or I just click it from the, uh, the shortcut list on the bottom. Um, resource, ma resource manager deployment model, which we're traditionally going to accept. And now we begin to sub specify the properties of our VNet. Now it's going to put in a lot of things, you know, as defaults right away. You don't need to accept the default. You can change pretty much whatever you want in here. I'm going to give this one, this one a name. I'm going to call this CloudNet and an address space. Now the address space for the VNet has to encompass all the subnets that are going to be located on it so we can route them properly. So this is typically, typically going to be either a 16 or higher subnet mask. So it defaulted to 172.18.00. That's fine. And then our subnet address range for the first subnet, we're going to modify to be 172.18.1.0/24. So now I've now got a single 24-bit mask subnet, or you know what what would be traditionally not considered a class C, but the same size as what would be a class C subnet. And then I've got a, what would be a class B size subnet as the VNet address space. Change my subnet name. I'm going to call this one subnet one, give it the address space, subscription, resource group, and I'm now ready to go ahead and create that virtual network. Now the thing to remember is the address spaces. We want to know those because as we add subnets and objects later on, they've got to fall within the address space of the VNet. Click create, and the creation process is actually pretty quick. We can see here the deployment is submitted. And it's now running in the background. We'll get a notification once this subnet is created. Okay, the VNet is finished. We can now go look at the properties and begin to add some additional subnets. So to begin with, we can look at the address space. This tells us the overall address range for the VNet. This is the initial address range we created. We can actually add additional address ranges if we want. For example, this VNet maybe also uncovers 172. Dot 19 dot zero dot zero slash 16 this, this gives me an additional set of address ranges I can use for subnets that are on this VNet so again we just got to make sure that when we create it we have all possible address spaces covered in the IP address ranges of the VNets we've got one subnet created by default and we can go ahead and create a second subnet which I'm going to call subnet two. And this one, remember, we just added a new address space, 19, and this is going to be subnet one, 172.19.1.0 on that address space. Make sure it has a unique name, and then click OK. So I've now got two subnets I can actually attach virtual machines to. And remember, Azure takes care of all the underlying routing, so we need, don't need to worry about things like default gateways, etc. Although we can configure them if we want. We can then go configure our DNS server settings. And so this is the DNS server that's allocated to any virtual machines that have a dynamic IP address. And we can do an Azure DNS or we can do a custom DNS if we have our own DNS server implemented, whether it's an Azure DNS server, a DNS server running in a virtual machine, or you know a public DNS server somewhere out on the internet. We're going to leave it on Azure DNS for now. So that's the basics of creating a subnet and a VNet in the new portal using Azure. What we're going to look at next is how we do a similar process to create a, an additional subnet, an additional VNet, using PowerShell. Now let's add a second VNet using PowerShell. Now to do this, we're going to add, we're going to use the new, the PowerShell command for new Azure RM virtual network. And the parameters are pretty straight, straightforward. Here's the name. We're going to call this one CloudNet2. Resource group. location, and the address space of the VNet. 
make a habit of always putting address prefixes in either single or double quotes. That's going to go ahead and create that new networking object or the new VNet. Uh, that takes just a couple of minutes, so we'll let that run, and then we're going to add a subnet using PowerShell. Okay, that network is created. Let's go ahead and add a subnet. So to do that, we're going to store the definition of the network in a variable. Check that variable, you can see it's got the, the definition. Then we're going to use the add subnet PowerShell command to go ahead and actually add a new subnet configuration. So we'll take our VNet variable and we'll pipe in an add Azure RRM virtual network subnet config object name of the subnet and the address scope of the subnet and making sure it's within the address space of the VNet. And we can see the definition is now updated but again keep in mind this definition is loaded in a local variable the last thing we need to do is actually write that local variable up to our Azure subscription, up to that virtual network definition. And to do that, we'll do set Azure RM virtual network, and then give it our variable. And it will now write that updated VNet configuration back to our Azure resource group. So we'll give that just a second to complete, and we'll go verify that those changes were made. That's been updated. Let's go back to our Azure portal refresh our resource group and we can see we've got a second VNet and in that second VNet we now have a subnet. So that's how you create the virtual network and the subnet definitions using PowerShell. Let's take a look at the process for creating a VNet using the classic portal. So I have the classic portal open and I've gone to my virtual networks node and I'm going to click the create a virtual network wizard. Give it, a, give it a name. Follow some classic VNet location. The next step is our DNS servers. We're going to leave the default Azure DNS, so we'll leave this empty. And then we get our basic IP configuration so we can begin to design our network address space. We have subnet 1. I'm going to adjust subnet 1 to be 10.1.0. And I'm going to give it a 16-bit subnet mask. Click the check mark and it'll go ahead and create that virtual network. Once that's created, we can then go in and edit to add additional subnets or additional address spaces. The next thing we'll look at doing is how we make modifications and changes using PowerShell. Let's go ahead and update our virtual network configuration in the classic portal using PowerShell. Now to do this, we have to download the network configuration as an XML file modify it and re-upload that file. So we're going to use get Azure VNet config, export to file, and give it an XML file name. It's going to download that configuration and put it in the file that we specified. Now we're just going to open that file in Notepad. It's going to make my font a little bit bigger so you can see it. And we can see in this text file, it's represented our network configuration as a simple XML document. Now, what we're most interested in in this document is our subnets. And what we're going to do is add a second subnet by simply copying and pasting that subnet configuration. Yeah, and the, the formatting doesn't really matter as long as it's a valid XML document. I just like my XML files to be pretty. And we're going to make this one subnet 2 and save the file. Now, I could make additional changes like changing my address space, adding additional address spaces, or other tasks. But I just wanted to do a simple thing, which is add a second subnet. Now we're going to upload that file. 
set Azure VNet config and the name of the file. That's going to take that file, upload it to Azure, and then make those changes to that Azure Classic Portal virtual network. We'll be able to see those changes reflected in the portal just as soon as the updates are complete. Uploads complete, changes are made, jump back in the new portal, and just have a look at the properties of this classic VNet, and we'll see that we've now got the second subnet added from that XML file. Once we've created networks, we can add virtual machines. Let's look at the different ways we can add a virtual machine to a virtual network. Now, when you add a virtual machine to a virtual network, you have to remember you have to also add it to the subnet. You're actually associating the virtual machine with the subnet object more so than the VNet. The subnet is in the virtual network in the VNet, so assigning it to a subnet accomplishes that task. And so you can see right here, we're creating a VM config and we're setting the subnet of the virtual machine. I'm actually going to do that with a highlighter. Setting the subnet and doing nothing else will allocate a, a dynamic uh, IP address to that virtual machine. And you can see that I'm doing it here. Here's one VM, and down here I've got a second VM doing the exact same thing. This VM is being allocated to subnet number two. So I'm just going to pull a dynamic IP. Again, very simple. We're just doing it, doing it in PowerShell for a version one virtual machine. For a version two virtual machine, it's a little bit different. For a version two virtual machine, we're not assigning the VM to a subnet. What we're doing is we're assigning a NIC to the subnet. So here, I'm creating a network interface that I'm adding to the virtual machine. The network interface is, is what has been associated with the subnet. So in this example, I've already created a network interface in some previous commands, and I'm adding the network interface to the VM via PowerShell. The act of adding the network interface to the VM associates it with the subnet because the NIC is part of the subnet, or I should say is attached to the subnet. That's what it looks like in PowerShell. Let's go ahead and create a virtual machine showing how we actually attach that virtual machine to a subnet through the process of creating it. Let's go ahead and deploy a new virtual machine on one of these newly created VNets. So we're simply going to click Add. I'm going to select a virtual machine from the marketplace. We'll do a Windows Server 2012 R2. Put our basic settings in. Resource group and location. And click OK. I'm going to choose a basic size, just a small size virtual machine. And then in our optional features, we'll have the option to select our existing networks. So we can choose either CloudNet or CloudNet2. And then within the network we select, we can choose which subnet we want the virtual machine to be attached to. Click OK, and we can now begin that virtual machine deployment. In our next module, we're going to dive into how IP addressing works for virtual machines running in Azure. Now, to begin with, it's important to understand that this behaves a little bit differently whether you, you're using Azure Service Manager deployment, the classic portal, or Azure Resource Manager deployment in the new portal. The objects are different and the capabilities are also slightly different. So what I want to point out here is, with this table, we have both public IP addresses on this side over here, and we have private IP addresses on this side over here. So for public IP addresses, the thing to remember is that only cloud services can have static public IP address. Everything else can only have a dynamic public IP address. So you would need to rely on DNS, dynamic DNS being updated to make these items name resolvable. For private IP addresses, everything, sorry, uh, sorry, yeah, for private IP addresses, everything can have a dynamic address 
with the exception of a PaaS role in a cloud service. So this is an example of if I have um, an Azure website, that's an example of a PaaS role, um, or Azure SQL Server that cannot have a static private IP address, it's got to have a dynamic private IP address. Everything else can have both static uh, and dynamic private IP addresses. A little bit different when we get to ARM. A virtual machine can have dynamic and static on a NIC. A front-end configuration can have dynamic and static. VPN gateways and application gateways, however, can only have dynamic public IPs. On the private side, anything, whether, whether it's a VM, a load balancer, or an application gateway, can have both dynamic and static private IP addresses. Now, the process of deploying a static IP, we had, um, we had mentioned in the previous module the notion of creating a virtual machine and attaching it to a subnet. All we've done in here is added a new step to that process where we're assigning it a static IP. And all I've done is I've created, and it's not showing it here, but I've created a, an IP address object called web IP, and I'm assigning that as part of the process of creating the virtual machine. For V2, let's walk through an example as well. Now this example is a little more detailed. Here, I'm doing kind of a more elaborate. I'm showing you the entire process end to end. I have a subnet that I'm creating. You can see here's the IP address scheme on the subnet. I have a VNet. Now, you might wonder, well, why am I creating the subnet before I create the VNet? Well, the answer is when you create a virtual network, you require at least one subnet. So the process of creating the virtual network, we tell it the first subnet object that's going to go in there. So I make my first subnet, then I create a VNet, and you'll notice if you compare the IP address space of the VNet with the IP address space of the subnet, the VNet's address space is always going to be larger than the subnet because you want to encompass the subnet with the VNet. We're then creating an IP address. Let me grab my highlighter again. Creating an IP address. We're requesting a public IP to go along with this IP address. So this is a, you know, not only a, 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 a private IP, but also a public IP. Creating a NIC. And then as part of creating the NIC interface, we're getting the subnet for the NIC, and we're also assigning the public IP address of the NIC. So what this is going to do is it's going to assign a dynamic public IP. Let me grab my pen here. So it's going to assign a dynamic public IP, and because we've specified the subnet, a dynamic private IP from that subnet. So it's going to have an address space somewhere in here on the private side, and the public, we never know what they're going to be. It's going to be one of the available Azure public IP addresses. And then when we create the VM, a little bit further down, we add the NIC. And the NIC is where the private IP on the subnet comes from, and the public IP that we're going to use to connect in from the internet comes from. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at how we take a virtual machine and assign a static IP address to it. Okay, let's take a look at how we can take a virtual machine and then just modify the IP addresses to switch them between static and dynamic. And also how we allocate and manage public IP addresses. So to begin, I've already deployed um, a, a virtual machine. It's a very simple, very basic virtual machine, um, basically using all the defaults. So we're kind of starting from if you go in and, and you go to the marketplace, you pick a Windows or a Linux virtual machine and you just deploy it, take the defaults. This is essentially what you get. Um, We'll start off with the fact that when this was deployed, we gave it a public IP address. And so there's an object in here um, called app server IP, which is the public IP address that's been allocated to this virtual machine. Now the public IP address is dynamic by default. We can easily switch it to a static public IP address by coming into its settings, looking at the configuration, and then changing it from dynamic to static. And then if we want to, adding a DNS label. We'll click Save on that. 
and we've now switched that from a dynamic public IP to a static public IP, so we know that that public IP address is not going to change if we offline the virtual machine. For the internal IP address of the virtual machine, we're going to look at the network interface that was created when the virtual machine was deployed. So we'll click on the network interface, and its properties are going to open. And we've got a setting called IP configurations. We'll click on that. And we can see the IP configuration for this particular interface. Now, if we click on the IP configuration that's stored, you can see as well, we've got public IP enabled. And we can actually take, you know, if this interface didn't need a public IP address, we can disable the public IP deassociated here. Or if we needed to change it to a different public IP address, you know, for whatever reason, we can do that right here. So we click on the IP addresses and we can change the public IP that we're using. We can choose the subnet the virtual machine is connected to. We've only got one subnet, so we've only got one option. And it's by default a dynamic IP. We can then change that to a static IP. And then we can choose the IP we want, or by default, it'll pick up the dynamic IP that was assigned. So for example, I want this to be 10. I can simply change it to 10. Click Save. It'll now go make those changes. Once those changes are saved, we can come back and look and see that the configuration has kind of detected those changes and updated to reflect what the current static, statically assigned IP address is. And that's it. Any virtual machine you deploy, that's how you adjust any public or internal IP address between static, dynamic, and also enable or disable a public IP. Virtual machines that are created can have more than one NIC. And in fact, it, in many cases, if you want to set up a network where you're connecting, as shown in this example right here, to multiple Azure networks, you have to create multiple NICs inside the VM. Now, how do you do this? Well, there's a couple of ways you can do it, and we'll show you an example here in a few minutes. But the first thing to keep in mind is the number of NICs that you have depends on the size of the virtual machine that you create. For example, um, a D1 virtual machine only has one NIC. If you try to deploy a template that has a D1 virtual machine and two network definitions, it's going to give you an error. A D3 gives you, for example, four NICs. So when you're determining the size of virtual machine, one of the factors you want to put in there is how many network interfaces do you need that VM to have. And you create the size that's appropriate or has the appropriate number of NICs. Now, there's some, uh, there's some considerations here. There is the notion of a default NIC. The default NIC is the NIC that's going to have the public IP address. So you cannot have more than one public IP associated with a single uh, virtual machine instance. You could have multiple private IPs, but only one public IP. Each network address must be on a separate subnet within the same network interface. And you have to do this in the client, ARM, or PowerShell. You cannot do this in the portal. So I can't go into the portal and add multiple network interfaces and configure them. I've got to do this via ARM, PowerShell, or the client. So we'll look at an example now of how I create a VM that has multiple network interfaces connected to multiple networks. And to do this, we're going to leverage an ARM template. So here's the process to create a virtual machine that's connected to two subnets. Uh, now to get started, I've got a resource group and all I've put in this resource group is a storage account to store the VHDs for the VM and I've defined my virtual network. Then on my virtual network, I've gone ahead and defined two subnets. I've got a front end subnet and I've got a back end subnet. So very straightforward, um, storage account, and then a VNet with two subnets, a front end and a back end. Now, you can create a virtual machine with two network interfaces, one connected to front, one connected to back using the portal. You've got to do this with either ARM or, as we're going to do it, with PowerShell. And so let's just walk through this script. It's not terribly complicated. We'll just look at the steps in the process. Step one is I just need to get a reference to each of my two subnets. When I create my network interfaces later on, 
I've got to tell it which subnet the interface is connected to. Um, and so all we're doing here is just getting a reference to both our front end subnet. So get virtual network cloud net resource group name, and then the first subnet, which is subnet zero and the second subnet, which is subnet one, it's a, a zero based array. So we'll, we'll run that one. We'll run that one and just verify front end. So here we can see we've got just a reference. We got a variable that's referencing our front end subnet and one for back end as well. So now we're going to create two NICs, right? So these are the NICs that are going to get connected to the virtual machine. Each NIC is connected to a particular subnet. So this is just a new Azure RM network interface, the visible name, the resource group location, and then what subnet this NIC is plugged into. Now it's going to default to a dynamic IP. Um, we, could, we could assign this a static IP here if we wanted to, but for simplicity's sake, we're just going to have this as a dynamic IP. And we'll go ahead and create the NIC for the backend interface. Next step here is we're going to be, begin constructing our VM. Uh, the first thing is to grab some credentials to use. So these will be the credentials that are supplied to the VM when it's initially deployed. And then we create a VM definition. Now, the important thing to note here is I'm using a standard D2. You've got to use a VM size that allows multiple NICs. A standard A1, for example, does not. Um, and A3 does. We're just using a D2. D2 supports two NICs. And then we're setting some basic things like the operating system and the source image. And this is just standard um, building a virtual machine in PowerShell stuff. Um, you can look at other demos for more detail on this, but this is just standard stuff. Now we're getting to kind of the meat of this, which is we're going to add the NICs to the VM. So we've created our VM definition, which we're storing in the variable VM, and we're now going to add our two NICs to that definition. One of these is a primary NIC. If we assign a public IP to this VM, that's the public IP, the, uh, that's the, uh, the network interface the public IP is going to go to. Um, so we're just adding both our NICs. And then the rest of this is going to be pretty standard stuff, which is defining our storage and then beginning the deployment. And we'll begin the deployment in just a second, but I want to come back up and just kind of point out that to add two NICs, it's no different than building any VM in PowerShell. We're just running the command to add our, add our Azure RM VM network interface two times and then referencing the NIC, front NIC or back NIC that we're adding. The front NIC and back NIC were defined here as network interfaces connected to a subnet and the subnet already exists that we just created a reference to it right here with this variable. So again, very straightforward process. We can now submit our deployment and that we'll go ahead and create this virtual machine. Process will take a couple of minutes. We'll come back and take a look at it once it's ready. All right, so that VM creation is complete. Let's jump back to the portal. Have a look at our resource group. And we can see we've got our new virtual machine. We've got our two network interfaces. And if we just take a look at the properties on this virtual machine, and look at its interfaces, we can see that it has two NICs, each connected to a different subnet. The first 10.0.1.0 and the second 10.0.2.0. And they've each got the first available IP, which is .4. Our next concept is that of a network security group. Now, a network security group, I think the name can be a little misleading. It's not a group of objects per se. It's a collection of rules that can be assigned to an entity within the networking configuration of Azure. So for example, if you think of you know, a traditional data center, you might have a router. And on that router, you have a port. And on that port, you have a set of rules that says, only internet traffic, HTTP or HTTPS, is allowed to come across this port. When it comes across this port, it's only allowed to go to certain subnets or certain locations on my internal network, again, to provide, provide a level of security. Well, a network security group is a similar concept. You can create a network security group and attach it to things like a subnet to govern the rules of what is allowed both inbound to that subnet and outbound from that subnet. A network security group is going to contain the following entries. It's going to have a name, 
it's going to have a direction, inbound or outbound. Now, the way these are represented within the Azure portal is you don't choose inbound or outbound when you create the rule. There's actually rule entries for inbound and rule entries for outbound. There are priorities, so you can have multiple priorities from 100 up to, if memory serves, I think 50,000 or 60,000. I, I forget off the top of my head. Those priorities tell you what the order of evaluation is. As soon as a piece of traffic reaches a rule that it matches, it's going to it's going to execute on that rule, whether it's an allow or a deny rule. You have the access type, whether it's allow or deny, source IP and port range, destination IP and port range, and the protocol that's in use. Now, when you create a rule, you don't necessarily specify all these objects. For example, if I create a network security group and I attach it to a subnet, well, the subnet that I attach it to tells me some of this information, the source port or the destination port. In the case of an inbound rule, the subnet tells me what the destination is. In the case of an outbound rule, the subnet tells me what the source is. So when you create these network security group rules, you don't specify every one of these entries, but bear in mind that all these entries make up all the details of a rule. You can do this in the, as you've seen right here, you can do this in the portal or you can do this via PowerShell. So in the classic PowerShell, in the Azure Resource, uh, Azure Service Manager model, there's new Azure Security Group and new Azure Security Group rule. In the Resource Manager, we have new Azure RM Security Group, which is the name of the group, we have the rule config and the subnet config. And we simply apply a rule config to a security group and a supply, apply a security group to a subnet config. So the order kind of goes down as you see them right here. The rule config is applied to the security group, the security group is applied to the subnet config, and that gives us the governing rules for traffic inbound and outbound on that subnet. So let's go take a look at creating some network security groups and creating some basic rules in those groups. Let's take a look at the process for creating and managing network security groups in Windows Azure. So I've got a, uh, to start with, I've got a, a resource group and I've created a virtual network that has a couple of subnets in this resource group. We click on it and look at subnets. We can see we've got two subnets created. We're going to use a network security group to begin to place rules they're going to govern the kinds of traffic that can traverse in and out of these subnets. So to begin, we're going to add a new network security group. So we'll click add. Type network security, select network security group. And then go ahead and click create. I'm going to give our network security group a name. Now, as a best practice, you kind of want to name the group to represent the kinds of rules that it's going to contain. For example, this network security group is going to be used to govern traffic going into and out of subnet one. So I'm going to call it subnet one security rules. And go ahead and click create. Now, creating the security group itself doesn't actually take all that long. It's really just a container for data, for rules such as you know where traffic is coming from, where it's going, and ports, protocols, and other related information. So we click refresh, and we can see we've now got our subnet one security rules created. Step two is we want to begin to associate this network security group with the objects it's going to govern access to. So I'll click on it. And we can see right now it has no rules and we can begin to associate it with different things. So for example, we can associate it with network interfaces to represent you know, firewall settings for traffic going into and out of individual virtual machines, or we can associate it with subnets to govern traffic going into and out of subnets. Now, our plan is to use this to govern traffic on subnet one. So we're going to choose that subnet one. So here's my, my virtual network. Here's subnet one on that network. Click OK, and it's now going to make that association. Now, one thing that's important to remember is if I want to now subsequently in the future 
delete this network security group, I first have to unassociate it with all the objects that it's managing. Uh, so you can't delete it as long as it's associated with interfaces or with subnets. So we've got that association complete. Now we can begin to create the rules that govern the traffic for this subnet. So we're going to look at inbound security rules. Now I want to allow web traffic 80 and 443 to come onto this subnet. So I'm going to click add. Give it an, a name. Allow HTTP. Source is going to come from anywhere. Service is going to be HTTP. And we're going to allow it. Click OK. Now you'll notice that in doing this process, I didn't specify a destination. The destination information comes from the fact that it's associated with the subnet. So the destination for this rule is the subnet or the interface that it's associated with. Allow HTTPS, you'll notice it bumped the priority. The priorities go from 100 all the way up to, I think, 50,000. I forget the exact number, but it's, it's really high. Um, and as you create these rules, it's going to increment them by 10 to give you, you know, room to associate rules in between. I could make, for example, 102, 103. The rules are always evaluated in the order of priority. And once a matching rule is found, that's the rule that will apply. And we're going to allow HTTPS. Again, no need to specify destination. The destination comes from the association with the subnet. So this is inbound traffic. Let's say that I wanted to restrict a certain type of outbound traffic. Maybe I didn't want to, to allow someone to connect to FTP from this subnet. So I would do an outbound security rule, add, deny FTP, service, FTP, and we're going to choose deny. And so this rule disallows any traffic going from the subnet to anywhere that's an FTP port 21 connection. So this will update and you'll see that new rule is in place. If we go back to our general settings for our, net, for our network security group, you can now see in the summary, we've got three simple rules created, two allow rules and one deny rule.